point. So welcome everyone back to the, the second day of Symmetries and Morphogenesis. Um, it's a unusually foggy and dark day in uh, Santa Barbara for a change. Um, uh, hopefully you're all doing well up there. So today we'll be turning our attention first to left-right asymmetry in, during development. Uh, and then uh, in the second session, we'll be discussing other forms of symmetry breaking. Um, our first speaker is Daniel Grimes. Uh, he's from the U University of Oregon. He's just started there uh, a bit over a year ago. And Daniel started off at uh, Oxford and then Princeton working on left-right asymmetry in first in mouse development, and then later on in zebrafish uh, to address related themes. Um, so his, his group uh, and his work has addressed heart development, cilia motility, um, and he's done some amazing work looking at the symmetry uh, regulation and the symmetry maintenance of the spine in zebrafish. Um, I was introduced to Daniel's work uh, through a very lucid review uh, article, which I recommend, where he stresses uh, understanding symmetry not as something to be broken, but to be maintained during development. And so perhaps we will hear a bit more uh, about that theme in this talk. Uh, without further ado, take it away, Daniel. Okay, thanks so much. Share my screen. <clears throat> okay, hopefully you can all see the slides. Uh, great. Okay, so thanks very much for that introduction and, and to all of the organizers for this opportunity to speak with you today. Um, like, like you said, I started out working on left-right asymmetry when I was a graduate student with Dominic Norris. Um, I actually left left-right asymmetry during my postdoc, where I worked in cell and spine development uh, with Rebecca Verdine at Princeton. And now in my own lab, uh, which I just started, I'm sort of trying to combine those two uh, principles to, to, to think about how symmetries are both broken in development and also how they're maintained during, during growth phases. So, oh, my slides aren't working. Okay, we are, in, in my lab, we're especially fascinated by the asymmetries and symmetries displayed by animal bodies. And the vast majority of animals um, currently existing are bilaterally symmetric in some way. They have a left and a right side. There are some uh, which are radially symmetric like this one, but most have bilateral uh, based on a bilateral body plan. And they're grouped in this group called bilateria. Now, some of those look like they're sort of radially symmetrical. That's kind of a secondary uh, symmetry. They, they start out life as, as bilateria. And then some have really striking asymmetries across left and right, like this uh, crab. But most, like us, are largely symmetric, at least externally, between left and right. And this symmetry really is, is um, you know, underpinned internally by the skeleton and the musculature, which is largely symmetrical uh, between left and right. But of course, we also have many really strong asymmetries internally. In fact, most of the internal organs show some sort of left-right asymmetry. You know, the heart's on the left, the liver is off to the right a bit, the, uh, the, the intestines all coil and loop asymmetrically, and even paired organs like the lungs and the kidneys um, show asymmetries in their position and, and their, their structure. So most of us have this normal arrangement of organs. There are people out there which have a complete mirror reversal of the situation. That's a condition called situs inversus. It isn't particularly damaging to health. Uh, but then there are also a group of diseases in which there are sort of partial inversions or more fine defects in left-right patterning, a disease called heterotaxy. And that actually can be quite, quite damaging. That's essentially a, a strong developmental defect, which often manifests as, as congenital heart disease. Why we have all of these asymmetries is not really known. Um, if you think evolutionarily, there, there are some people that predict that it may have arisen um, by a selective advantage from having the gut tube become longer than the body, you know, to absorb more nutrients or something. And that may have sort of necessitated some sort of directional coiling of the gut. And that may have sort of kickstarted this, this whole internal asymmetries that we now see. So my lab, as I mentioned, really thinks about these things in, in two ways. We think about how does the embryo initially break symmetry to give rise to these left-right asymmetries. Um, but at the same time, in the same embryo, using many of the same pathways, other structures, you know, things like the limbs, the skeleton, the muscles, have to maintain symmetry. So how, how is this all occurring 
all at once in the same embryo. And that's what I hope to work on in the future. Um, today I'll mostly talk about this, this first part, since we're in a, a hydrodynamics uh, session, and talk about how the embryo initially breaks left-right symmetry. I will, over the next few slides, describe how uh, we as a field think this works in the mouse embryo. And I'll just start by saying it's really an honor for me to be going before Hiroshi Hamada on this, because his lab, more than, more than anyone else, has really sort of worked out all the mechanisms I'll describe in the next few slides. Um, and hopefully this serves also as, a, as an introduction for, for his talk. So if we look at the early mouse embryo, which is so, sort of schematically represented here, um, flattened out, we've also got a head and a tail. This uh, midline section has the, has the notochord, which is kind of like an embryonic uh, precursor to the spine. And you can see the embryo is starting to segment here with somites. But I wanted to draw your attention to this critical structure at the tip of the notochord called the embryonic node. This is like a flat sheet of cells. And it's really important for left-right um, patterning. And we can see that straight away if we look at gene expression, because a major asymmetric molecular player in this whole pathway is nodal, which becomes expressed specifically on the left-hand side at about the level of the node. Now, nodal is a secreted protein. Um, it can activate its own, it, itself, and it also activates its own inhibitor, lefty. Uh, so this sets up a sort of pseudo reaction diffusion type system, which allows nodal to spread throughout the left side of the embryo uh, in the lateral plate mesoderm, and lefty, which is more expressed in the middle of the embryo, prevents this nodal signal from leaking across and cross-contaminating the right side. So that sort of maintains the, the left side identity. And nodal is really highly conserved throughout vertebrates and many invertebrates as well as a, as a left-sided um, protein. But the question is, of course, how is this nodal initially activated on the left in the first place? And that involves these organelles, uh, cilia. So I'm sure you're all familiar with cilia are sort of like hair-like protrusions coming out of the surface of cells. And most of our cells have cilia, but a, so a small subset of those cilia are actually motile. So they beat under their own, their own force and this generates fluid flows um, across the surfaces of cells and, and across tissues and down tubes. And I'm introducing these because if we look in the embryonic node, we see that there are cilia. Hopefully you can see this movie. And in this case, the cilia, there's sort of one per cell and they're sort of rotating around like a, like a propeller. And this rotation the, the, the net result of this entire field of cilia rotating is to generate an asymmetric fluid flow. So this is sort of just tracing fluorescent particles, which we, we actually did in collaboration with Hiroshi, this part. Um, and you can see in black, sort of the flow is mostly leftwards and in red is, is giving an idea of the speed of the flow. And this bulk leftward flow that we, that we see in this structure uh, is probably the first sort of gross large scale asymmetric um, events that are, that's occurring in embryos. So what's the result of this fluid flow? Well, I want to introduce one more gene to you, DAN D5. This is also another repressor of the nodal pathway, and it's expressed initially symmetrically just around the edges of this structure of the node. And the result of fluid flow towards the left is to repress DAN D5, such that DAN D5 reduces on the left, and because this is a repressor of nodal, this you know, allows nodal to overcome some threshold and it activates on the left-hand side. So this is sort of the system of how, how uh, the field believes symmetry is first broken in the embryo by fluid flow, repressing DAN D5, which then derepresses nodal. And I think out of all of this, the key thing we don't still understand very well is how the fluid flow signal works, how, um, how the flow is sensed by cells and how that pathway is then transduced within sensory cells to ultimately repress this, this key gene down you find. And that's really the topic I wanna to focus on for most of today. Um, but just before I do that, I wanted to mention why the fluid flow is leftward. That's, that's often a question people, people think about. And this was really worked out by, initially by theoreticians and biophysicists. And I think this field actually has a long history of great collaborations between sort of theoretical physicist minded people and then more experimental biologists. And this is a great example of that. Um, back in 1990, Nigel Brown and Lewis Wolpert published a, a paper which was sort of entirely just driven by thinking about this process. 
in which they proposed an F molecule. This was before we knew about cilia. Um, and the F molecule idea was that to, to break left-right symmetry consistently in one direction, you need some sort of structure or molecule which can align itself with the other two axes, the anterior, posterior, and dorsal ventral axes. Once you're aligned with those two axes, the sort of the plane perpendicular to those is, is the left-right plane. And then if that molecule also has a sort of inherent chirality to it, um, I think Brown and Walbert imagine sort of a, mo a motor walking in one direction, perhaps then it can consistently break the asymmetry across the left-right plane, maybe by walking a molecule to one side and not the other. And this was really remarkable in hindsight because cilia seem to um, fulfill a lot of those characteristics. Cilia protrude from the ventral side of cells, so they, they have a ventral and dorsal ventral polarity. They also, as Hiroshi showed, um, move towards the posterior side of cells in the node, so they tilt towards the posterior, so they have anterior-posterior polarity. And then, of course, they also have this inherent chirality in that they rotate clockwise as we, as we look down on them, or, and all of them rotate in that direction. So th those three bits of information, that anterior, posterior, dorsal ventral, and then the inherent chirality can kind of combine together. You know, you, you need three coordinates, if you like, to help break consistently left-right symmetry. And how that seems to work is that if you imagine the cilia tilting towards the posterior, when they swish over towards the right-hand side, they're very, very close to the cell surface, and they're sort of inefficient at moving fluid in the, in the right direction. But when they flip back towards the left, they're almost perpendicular to the cell surface, and this, this secondary stroke is much more efficient at moving the fluid. So the addition of all of these cilia um, being polarized like this is that the fluid flow is leftward. And I like to bring this up because of this great collaboration between physicists and biologists which, which figured this out. I think this was all predicted theoretically before it was shown experimentally. But to move on to the sort of primary question that I want to talk about today, uh, which is how does, is fluid flow working to, to repress this key gene down E5 on the left? Um, one of the main thinking um, in this sort of section of the field has been focused on the gene PKD2, which is um, an ion channel, a, a cation channel. It seems to transduce um, mostly monovalent cations, but also actually calcium. And uh, Martina Borekna's group and others have shown that when you, when you mutate PKD2, you have severe left-right defects. But additionally, they observed a strong left-sided calcium signal um, downstream of fluid flow. So when you move, remove fluid flow, you, you also lose that calcium signal. And for many years, we've been thinking about this in, sense of, in the terms of a fluid flow um, is sensed on the left-hand side to elicit a calcium signal, which maybe somehow then affects Dan, Dan 5 expression. When I was in Dominic's lab, um, Dominic Norris, we were looking, we were thinking about other genes that might play a role in this process, because PKD2 itself doesn't feel like you know, it, it will be the sort of protein involved in truly sensing a flow signal. Uh, it's, it's much more considered like a, as an effector channel, I guess, of that signal. And doing sort of mouse genetics, we came upon this protein, PKD1 like 1, um, which is a member of the polycystin family. It's a very large transmembrane protein with many uh, distinct domains in its extracellular portion. We did various well, I, I should say first, it, it does have a very striking left-right patterning defect. This is a quick gene expression of a nodal in the embryo, and you can see in the wild type it's nicely on the left-hand side where it should be. In PKD1 like 1 mutants, uh, it's on both sides, so symmetry breaking has not, has not occurred in these embryos. We've we kind of got two left sides. Um, and we, we did a little bit of cell biology and, and sort of interaction work and found that PKD1 like 1 does in fact physically interact with PKD2. And also, they seem to co-localize to the same place in the cell. They're, go they're going into, into cilia themselves, uh, which, is, which is interesting. But we also wanted to sort of directly assess whether this PKD1 like 1, or perhaps this entire complex, can take part in a, in a response to fluid flow signals. And to do that, we turned to a sort of in vitro system where we cultured flow sensory cells. These, these were actually vascular endothelial cells. And th in this case, they're loaded with a calcium indicator. And when you apply fluid flow to these cells, you, you do often see a calcium transient. Uh, 
And we were able to demonstrate by adding in PKD1 like 1 and removing it and things like that, that in the presence of PKD1 like 1, um, we did see a nice response to artificially applied fluid flow. But in the absence of PKD1 like 1, this flow response didn't occur. So this data did seem to suggest that PKD1 like 1 can play some role, maybe not directly as, as a sensor, but some role in the, in the pathway which um, transduces a, a flow signal into you know, intracellular, in this case, calcium uh, signals. Another thing we, we worked on was this extracellular domain. Um, it's particularly interesting. It's, a, it's called a PKD domain, and it's essentially an immunoglobulin-like domain. And they're very interesting because they're, they have interesting mechanical properties. So physicists or protein physicists have used experiments like atomic force microscopy to mechanically essentially pull on these domains. And of course they unfold, but the interesting property of this domain displays is that it partially unfolds and then it makes new sort of non-native hydrogen bonds. And th that actually makes the domain stronger, physically stronger, so you have to pull even harder to fully unfold it. And this phenomenon, which is called kind of catch bonds, uh, of having different states, different conformational states under different levels of applied force is, of course, a property associated with mechanical, mechanosensory proteins. Um, so, and that, that, that led us to want to investigate this domain a bit more closely because, of course, fluid flow may be imparting a mechanical force in some way on, on uh, cilia or the, or the cell surface themselves. And to do this, we, we essentially had a, a mutant ver version. Uh, we mutated a single amino acid and when we characterized this physically, we found that this sort of helped the domain unfold, so it, it didn't have its normal mechanical properties. But the overall protein was still assembled and still localized to the correct place and things. So we didn't think we were affecting the entire protein, but, but fairly specifically that, that one domain. And taking this mutation into our calcium assay, again, rendered the protein completely insensitive to fluid flow signals. So it, it did seem like that, that um, extracellular small domain is in some way involved in this protein being sensitive to upstream flow signals. So that leads to our model in which we now have a few different genes, PKD2, which we've known about for a long time, and then PKD1 like 1 as well, potentially a sort of a partner, acting between the fluid flow signal and DAND5 repression. And indeed, when we look at DAND5 asymmetry, normally it's higher on the right than the left, but in PKD1 like 1 mutants, it's, it's much more symmetrical. So that sort of fits this idea here. Now, in this slide, I'm summarizing really a lot of genetic work that we did, which I don't want to go through in detail. But essentially, we dissected that, that pathway I've shown you into, into this system, which is sort of like a multiple repression-based system where fluid flow is actually repressing PKD1 like 1 rather than activating it, which was a bit of a surprise to us which then seems to be repressing PKD2, and then that represses DAN5, which represses NODAL. Uh, so because fluid flow is really only present on the left, this pathway sort of operates on rever in reverse on the two sides, where flow is strong here, leading to active PKD2 and calcium signals on the left, and then repressing DAN5 and allowing NODAL to activate. And that all seems to fit our phenotypes. So for instance, um, if you lose PKD1 like 1 on both sides, you'd expect PKD2 to be active on both sides, and therefore nodal to be active on both sides, which we, which we do see. But also remember that, that point mutation I talked about, this D411G mutation, which specifically inactivates that domain. That actually, when, when in the mouse, gave a completely different phenotype, which for a while we couldn't really explain. Rather than giving bilateral nodal, it gave complete absence of nodal in the LPM. Um, and it seems like this repression system potentially can explain that if we think about this variant as still being able to repress PKD2, but being completely insensitive to the flow signal, so it can't be repressed itself. So it's almost like a, a dominant negative version. Uh, that leads, ultimately, if you follow the logic, to, to no nodal expression, and that's what we see. So that's our current sort of gen genetic model of how PKD1 like 1 and PKD2 might be playing a role um, downstream of the, the flow signal. To, to repress this key gene, DANDY5. Uh, I should say that 
more recently, I, I mean, I had to sort of gap where I didn't work on left right patterning, but more recently I've returned to it in my own lab and we're following up some of this work. Uh, we have found this is, seems to be completely conserved in zebrafish and actually Hiroyuki Takeda's lab um, also sort of co-discovered this role for BGD1 like one using the darker fish. So this role for BGD1 like one does seem to be quite broadly conserved. I'm just giving you one quick example here of a, of a zebrafish which has um, normally has this specific gene expressed on the left side of the brain in, a, in our PKD1 like one mutants we're instead seeing a randomization of this. So clearly strong left right pattern defects in, in fish mutants as well. Um, and also nicely another lab published some human patients who uh, displayed left right patterning defects of the organs. You can see the heart here is off to the right instead of the left. Um, and, they, and they isolated PKD1 like one variants which, which caused this. So that was very, very nice for us to see. Um, let's sort of think. Maybe this is a good time if you want to pause for questions. If there are any questions? There must be some. Oh, I can ask one briefly. So um, you mentioned at the very beginning that uh, uh, the, just going back to the, the biggest picture of left-right asymmetry mm -hmm. um, from the evolutionary standpoint being potentially due to the coiling of the gut and the constraints and uh, benefits of having longer intestinal tract. Is that divergence thought to, or is that um, that? feature thought to arise before the divergence between vertebrates and invertebrates? Or is this, un is this known? I think it probably is more ancient than that. So invertebrates um, do also display asymmetries, maybe not as striking as vertebrates, but, you know, internally. But um, there are many internal asymmetries, particularly of the gut, in fact, in, in things like Drosophila. So clearly, Structural asymmetries are much more ancient than vertebrates. Um, nodal is also, it's not, not in, involved in Drosophila because nodal doesn't exist in Drosophila, but in, in other invertebrates, the nodal pathway is also important. Um, where, where the divergence comes in is that cilia probably don't have a role in invertebrates. Mm -hmm. um, but there are sort of more ancient pathways, things like the polarity pathway that I talked about, which positions cilia, um, and maybe microtubule chirality, which is inherent in cilia, but also can be can affect you know cells themselves. Uh, that that clearly plays a role in in invertebrates. So I think it's it's a complex evolutionary history and things have sort of come and gone. Um, yeah. So when you see that these uh, these themes arise not only in in my, mice but as homologs uh, in fish as well, you right. see that as sort of an extension of the same um, sort of lineage of of symmetry breaking uh, in the evolutionary tree, going back so. before. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I it, it could be that it's, there's multiple different types of asymmetries arisen, and that might help explain some of the controversies in the field. You know, there's a little bit of controversy about whether the flow signal, especially in things like frog, is is the only thing which breaks sort of large scale symmetry, or whether there are other pathways which come about when you remove the flow. Um, I think in, in organisms like mouse, clearly the flow signal is the, the, the main primary driver of, the, of this whole thing. Um, but it becomes a bit more blurry as you look at other organisms. And certainly in vertebrates, there's, there's no flow. But like you said, I do think um, we can sort of unite all of these systems in some way based on microtubule polarity and, and, and sort of planar polarity of cells as well. I think that's, sort of, that's the sort of deeper evolutionary origin of all of these things. Thank you. Why don't you plunge onward? Okay, I'll keep going. As Eric said. Could I ask one quick question, please? Uh, oh, yes, please. David. Um, the, um, uh, if uh, a person with anomalous left-right asymmetry in the heart um, has offspring, is it at all heritable, or is it an accident that just happens uh, without any heritability? Is it dominant? Is it recessive? Right, so a little bit of both. I mean, heterotaxy mainly occur, especially the, the sphere cases, um, is mostly spontaneous mutations. But there's definitely also some heritability to some of these mutations. Uh, largely, I would say dominant, though. I don't know the specific case, that specific heart defect you're referring to, to be honest. So I can't specifically answer that question. 
but broadly speaking, mostly spontaneous mutations in, in the more severe heterotaxy cases. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll plow on. So the last thing I mentioned was this is sort of the, the current simple model of, of where we are with this. Um, I want to briefly mention that, as we sort of said in the question, this is very highly conserved in zebrafish as well. This, this whole module exists, there's fluid flow, there's Dan5 repression. These two genes have a, have a critical role. Um, the structure in which this is occurring is quite different in zebrafish. Instead of being like the flat node plane that you have in mouse, in fish it's actually sort of an internal sphere with the cilia pointing inwards. Uh, so it's a bit harder to imagine how an asymmetric flow can be generated in a structure like this, but it does seem to occur when, when you image the, the fluid moving around. It's clearly stronger on the left-hand side. And that again manifests as down five left-right asymmetry. So what an undergraduate student in my lab has recently been doing, and I just want to mention this is something that we're giving a go, um, is to try and figure out other genes involved in this process, because I think one of the key things we're missing is the transduction pathway, which potentially goes from PKD1 like one, PKD2 at the membrane to repressing DAN D5. Now we, we know potentially calcium is, is part of this. Um, but there's no obvious link, at least to me, between calcium and dandy 5 repression. Um, and there's no obvious link between polycystin proteins and dandy 5 repression. So I'm imagining the sort of a transduction cascade, which is initiated by the flow signal to give rise to these asymmetries. And really one of the, one of the goals that this undergraduate student in my lab is, is trying to, to do is to, to find more of these potential regulators of this pathway. And we have many genes that could potentially be involved based on literature searches and also like RNA-seq studies to, to see what's expressed in this vesicle. And the vast majority do have a completely unknown function. Um, so we've sort of done computational, um, you know, we, we've tried to limit our list of genes that we want to look at. And now we're sort of screening through to try and find regulators. The classical way of doing this, or not classical, the, the current way of doing this in zebrafish would be to use CRISPR and to make a mutant. So I don't know if you're familiar with zebrafish, but essentially you, you would inject the CRISPR materials into the egg, um, raise the fish, and then cross them and raise them again. And then eventually you'd intercross the parents and search for, for mutants. This, of course, takes two or three generations, which is quite time consuming because the fish generation time is pretty long. So instead, we've taken a sort of more rapid screening approach since we're doing so many genes. And to do this, you essentially just do the same thing, but you inject a higher amount of CRISPR components, more, more Cas9, more guide RNAs, and this can give you phenotypes sort of straight away in the injected embryos. So this is a really rapid approach for trying to figure out if genes are involved in, in processes in general. Um, in our particular case, we obviously need a readout to see if left-right patterning has been affected, and for this we're using heart asymmetry. So the heart in fish starts out life as a sort of symmetrical cone at the center, and I think my movie is playing, but I don't see it moving, so I'm not sure if you can see it moving or not. But if this movie isn't moving, what you should be seeing is um, the heart essentially starting out as a cone and then moving to the left-hand side and elongating, and it becomes, it becomes a tube off to the left. And this particular asymmetric morphogenetic event does depend on that left side of nodal signaling. There are other events of heart asymmetry which don't depend on nodal and are more intrinsic to the heart, but this one does seem to be quite dependent on, on nodal. And that means that this asymmetry is a really great readout of upstream asymmetry defects happening in, in Cooper's vesicle. Such that when you lose that, that system, you end up with hearts either pointing to the left or perhaps to the middle or off to the right, usually some sort of randomization. So our experiment becomes very simple. You inject the CRISPR material uh, to inactivate genes, you incubate the embryos for a day or so, and then you just assess the position of the heart. And we have been doing this just to show you some controls. Um, PKD2, you know, this is amount of abnormal hearts that we're seeing in embryos. PKD2, of course, disrupts this process. Dandy5 very strongly uh, works well, disrupts this process, and some other proteins also do. So we've optimized and validated this approach to try and discover new genes involved in left-right asymmetry. And we are sort of on undertaking that screen right now. What I will say is we have discovered some, some new proteins which 
are quite interesting. Things that interact with calcium, for instance. Um, it's, it's a bit early in my lab to, to give you much more data than that because we're in the process of making full mutants. You know, you can't base anything just off this sort of rapid screening approach. But uh, we do have many potential candidates to sort of help populate that, that pathway, which is acting downstream of the polycystins at the membrane to, to transduce the flow signal. And I just want to end now with um, a different system that we work on, which was mentioned right at the start, uh, because motile cilia are, are communicating signals via fluid flows, not only in the left-right patterning system, but in, in many other potentially systems in, in biology. This, this is an early zebrafish embryo, about a day old, and the expression is showing you the location of motile ciliated cells. And you can see there's some in the nose. This is the brain ventricles here. This is the uh, central canal of the spine. And this is the kidney. So in all those places, motile cilia are potentially generating fluid flows. And if we just look at this particular location here, uh, you can see in cyan, the cilia quite densely in the central canal. These cilia are generating uh, cerebrospinal fluid flow through the canal. And we're working on this because it, it seems to be involved in a really interesting morphogenetic event, which is, can you see this movie? No. Unfortunately not. Oh, there we go. So not an amazing movie, but you can see hopefully that if you, if you try and forget about the wiggling this fish is doing, um, you can see the tail gradually elongating, elongating and straightening, right? So it starts out pretty curved. And then over time, the tail is straightening out and eventually it escapes. We have, we have to repeat this by sort of paralyzing the muscles um, so we can see it better. But this process is called axial straightening. And this is sort of schematically de depicted here. The, the zebrafish embryo starts out curved around the yolk. And then as the tail elongates, it also straightens out to give a, to give a straight body. And this absolutely depends on those motile cilia and, and presumably the fluid flows they generate such that in a wild type fish, you have a nice straight body, but motile cilia mutants invariably lead to this very strong ventral curvature of the body. So we and, and several other labs are trying to work on how motile cilia and fluid flow are communicating information about the status of curvature of the body um, and ultimately how they lead to this straightening event. And what's particularly interesting to me is that this seems to keep occurring throughout life. It's required throughout at least growth phases of the fish, such that, you know, this is, these, these are early embryos, but if we do this in juvenile fish or, or even later, up to several weeks of age, if we remove the, the motile cilia and the CSF flow, the, now the spine begins to curve, right? So this is a, this is a wild type fish. You can see it's got a relatively straight spine here. And when you remove fluid flow late onset, so not th these early curves, but later, um, the, the spine starts to give rise to these interesting curves. So it seems to be true that, um, or at least our model, is that fluid flows keep the body and spine straight throughout many, many different phases of life. Uh, and we do think this condition seems to model a human disease, scoliosis, which is a disease of a spinal curvature often occurring during during growth spurts and there's very little known about how this how this occurs so my lab is also trying to follow up how cells via these flows that they generate communicate information um, to the growing spine and prevent it from from curving so i think that's my time i'll just end with a sort of trying to unite these two topics um, what I told you about earlier on was that a fluid flow signal seems to be acting via PKD1 like one, PKD2 complexes, potentially then listening a calcium signal um, in the left-right patterning system. Now, in the spinal system I just told you about, there are also flow sensory cells, and those flow sensory cells express PKD1 like two and PKD2 like one. And in fact, when we mutate these, we also see spinal curves. So this suggests that Potentially, there's also a polycystin complex downstream of the flow signal in that system. And then, of course, in the kidney, where PKD1 and PKD2, the sort of founding members of these families, have been quite well studied, there's also many models which suggest that these two proteins are acting downstream of fluid flows in the kidneys to prevent uh, polycystic kidney disease, which is what names this, this PKD. So 
it seems like there's sort of this um, trend emerging where pairs of polycystine proteins, perhaps functioning as complexes, are acting downstream of fluid flows in a variety of contexts. And I think it'll be interesting to, you know, figure out these mechanisms downstream of what these pathways initiate and what the effect is on the cell. In this case, we know it's done five asymmetry in some way. Um, but it'll be interesting to see if there's any, um, you know, parallels between these different systems. The other thing I find interesting is why different homologs have been used. Now, it could just be for sort of fairly evolutionary reasons that, that don't make much sense in hindsight. But there are also interesting differences between these family members. They don't all do exactly the same thing. You know, for instance, this family has slightly different makeup of domains in its extracellular portion. And in particular, these PGD domains, which I mentioned, uh, you know, have these mechanical properties. There are completely different numbers of these domains in these different homologs. And I do wonder if that, you know, if, if this is a mechanosensitive protein or a mechanosensitive property, I do wonder if that changing the number of domains in different contexts allows these cells to be sensitive to different ranges of flow forces or, or, or some of the signal induced by the flow. So we're also trying to follow that up. Okay, so I'll stop there. Um, thank you all for listening, of course. Um, the members of my lab who have been, you know, great. We, we only started last year and most of that's been through coronavirus, but they're, they're bearing up well. Um, our collaborators and my previous mentors, most of the work I've described today was, was done when I was a trainee in Dominic Norris's lab and then a little bit in Rebecca Bedine's lab as well. So I, I must thank them. And uh, thank you all for listening. So. Thank you so much. That was great. <clears throat> well, let's start off with a question from David Nelson. Well, yeah, thanks. That was really um, stunningly beautiful and very, very clear. Um, Thank you. Just a, a short question about um, your rapid screening for mutants. Um, if you inject with a high concentration of Cas9, do you have to worry about some analog of off-target effects where you might get double mutants um, just at such high concentrations? How do you screen uh, for that? Yeah, that's true. This this technique certainly has some drawbacks, and I think off-target effects is is the primary one. Um, I think essentially we're, we're using the screening approach to narrow giant, narrow down genes that might be involved, but of course we will always follow those up with you know more more precise germline mutants um, to sort of verify. It is true that we have also done many controls. All the positive controls do give us the expected left-right defects, and none of the negative controls do. So you know, it seems so far that we're not getting too many false positives. Uh, but of course, with unknown genes, we, we can't really know the answer to that. So we, we do have to always verify with, with sort of full genes. Thanks. We have another question from Vijay. Hi, uh, fascinating talk. Uh, I wonder if the cilia stop rotating after the left-right axis is established? or did they keep continually driving flow? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, they do just continue to, to, to beat, I think. Um, I don't know if flow is functional at that stage or if one stand five is asymmetric, sort of the functional role is over, but they keep beating because they're a very stable structure. You know, once the, the, they beat because of dynein motors and once they're imported into cilia, they're, they're quite long lived in there. So they might just keep beating for that reason. Um, Embryologically, the node, you know, not long after left-right patterning phases, many of the cells of the node sort of go into the node accord and the, and the node structure breaks down. So this is not going on for like many, many hours after left-right patterning. Um, but I don't think there's a defined sort of end point to the cilia beating. I think they just sort of fizzle out over time. So to, to follow up, is there a starting point? Do they start beating at some point? Right, yes. So um, they, they do, they, they emerge from the cells uh, in the in the central region, uh, the center of the cell, they gradually move towards the posterior side, and over this period, the beating sort of increases gradually over time. And then, once the beating is strong enough that fluid flow is being generated uh, to a high enough level, a little bit after that, we start seeing the Dan Dandy five asymmetry occurring. So that there is a not a not a totally defined starting point. We don't really know what level of flow is functional, but clearly they they're not beating, they start, and then we see the asymmetries gradually generate. Thanks. A question from Sigaline. Uh, hi, uh, 
Daniel. I have a question about your uh, your screen. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I did not fully understand how you can restrict uh, the candidates to those which are involved uh, as you're looking for between the polycysteines and the DANDI5, because if you're looking at such a late phenotype, there could also be some candidates involved in, for example, in lateral plate mesoderm. Yeah, that's absolutely true as well. Um, so to get around that will again it'll require follow-up experiments so we are initially limiting the genes we look at um to the ones that we think are expressed or at least enriched in cooper's vesicle so that's that's one start but but they could still be expressed in the lpm certainly um the other approach that we'll have to ultimately do is to you know once we have strong promising candidates we will analyze in more detail whether they are generating fluid flow whether they're generating cooper's vesicle in the first place because that would be sort of, you know, boring reasons to give left right defects. If we see Dan D5, asymmetry is completely normal, but then there are still heart defects that would imply a defect downstream of Dan D5, maybe in the LPN, maybe in the heart itself. So I guess we'd, we'd get around, you know, we'd figure that out with, with follow up work rather than what I explained today. Yeah. Do you have any ideas of how to make the screen specific? You know, maybe we could express Cas9 specifically in you know, the, the KV or something, that might, that might be useful as well. Hiroshi had a question. Well, Dan, uh, it's a great talk. And uh, I have a question about, I was interested in the relationship between the flow and PKD1 like one and PKD2, double negative, triple negative, the, the relationship and uh, I guess the genetic relationship is very convincing it's very clear but what about the, mo the molecular at the molecular level it, do I understand correctly if I said that uh, maybe the long uh, long extracellular domain of the PKD1 like one is in suppressing the, the, the channel activity of the PKD2 in the absence of the flow, but when flow comes, the, it releases the suppressing activity of the, somehow, suppressing activity of the one like one. It, right. what do you think it's the, yeah, I, I think, so it is, it is purely a genetic model at the moment. Like yeah. So, so we, we don't really know physically what's happening, mm -hmm. um, but the, the genetics would suggest um, precisely what you said. We, we think um, PKD1 like one might be repressing PKD2 until fluid flow reaches a certain level and that signal, um, whatever that is, then de then removes the repression of PKD on PKD2, allowing that to activate. And this, you know, re represses like that, maybe it's a good system for preventing stochastic activation mm -hmm. of PKD2 mm -hmm. and then maybe, because um, this is a very sensitive system with lots of feedback loops, of mm -hmm. course, you, you mm -hmm. don't want to sort of stochastically activate and, and otherwise you'll end up amplifying those activations. So maybe the repression system really holds the, the pathway completely turned off until mm -hmm. the fluid flow is, is strong and is, is leftward and is not sort of just getting started. That could be one way to think about it. But physically what's happening, I, I don't think we, we know. I mean, in some way, PKD1 like one must be repressing PKD2. I don't know if the extracellular portion is required for that repression. Right. From the genetics, it seems like the extracellular portion is required for PKD1 like one to be repressed by flow. Uh, uh -huh. The repression of PKD1 like one on PKD2 could be mm -hmm. other parts of the protein. Mm -hmm. do, do, you, do you know there is any the biochemical or structural the data that supports your idea? So there's, there is some structural data on PKD1 and PKD2, mm -hmm. and I think we can assume PKD1 like one it's going to be pretty similar to PKD1, at least in those membrane portions. Um, and they, they clearly interact quite strongly within the membrane and also in the C-terminal portion. And uh, whether there's information within that about precisely how it could repress, I, I don't think there is. And I think that's partly because the structures are still lacking these extracellular portions mm -hmm. largely. Um, but I think I think they'll, those will be coming soon with the advances in cryo EM. So maybe okay. there'll be a maybe there'll be a model. I should say PKD1 and PKD2 in the kidney system don't mm -hmm. seem to be repressors of each other. They seem to act, you know, I see. Uh -huh. the same. Mm -hmm. um, so this this does seem like a difference. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, in the vasculature where PKD1 and PKD2 
uh, are also involved in potential mechanosensitive responses mm -hmm. in that system that does appear to be a potential negative association mm -hmm. between the two. Mm -hmm. So it seems like both positive and negative regulation is, mm -hmm. is possible with these mm -hmm. two proteins. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I think we're just about out of time. There's a couple more questions, but we'll have to hold those off for till after uh, Hiroshi's talk. So 